So a quick welcome to everybody who's joining us. I see several of you are still joining on. While we're waiting for the rest of our participants, go ahead and toss into the chat where you're joining us from tonight. We're very happy to have you all here. We're just going to wait a few more minutes to get the rest of our participants on. So thank you for waiting. Welcome everybody. I see we've still got some participants joining on. So if you're just joining us, go ahead and throw into the chat where you're joining us from tonight. We're gonna wait just a couple more minutes here as we let others uh, log into the webinar. So thanks for your patience while you do that. I see we've got tons of folks, not just from Arizona, but from all over Louisiana, Illinois, Florida. Oh my gosh. So Gilbert, Tyler and Drew from Gilbert. Hello, thanks for joining us tonight. We do have at least one of our uh, participants who said they can't uh, hear anything. So um, I'm going to throw a note into the chat because you can't hear me right now anyway. Excellent. A couple other questions rolling in. We're just waiting for the last of our participants to join on for tonight. Thank you all for being here. We'll get started in just a few moments. A couple of questions that have come in, um, just making sure that you guys can hear us. So double check your audio. Uh, I put a note in the chat, so hopefully you can't hear me if you're having trouble with your audio right now, but that's okay. We'll get you taken care of and uh, just double check those audio settings. Um, also, if you are joining us tonight, this is a webinar. So yes, your video and audio are turned off. Uh, don't worry, we'll go over housekeeping on how to ask questions in just a few moments, but we can't hear you or see you. So go ahead and enjoy that snack while we're talking today. Anybody else who just joined us, you go ahead and throw in the chat where you're joining us from tonight. We'd love to know where you're coming from. And it looks like we've got a group from all over the United States tonight. So we're real excited to have you here and we're gonna get joining or get going here actually right about now. Go ahead and stop sharing our slides here. Excellent. All right, little coordination there. Well, welcome everybody, thrilled to have you all. I'm Sari Custer, Chief of Science and Curiosity at Arizona Science Center, and I'll be host today. I'm going to welcome you to our astronaut virtual series, the second in the series, and it's made possible with generous support from the Richard F. Harris Charitable Trust. So thank you to our friends there for making this happen. This series is all about finding dynamic ways to connect you with experts in space exploration from a variety of different backgrounds. And it ties into our special exhibition, Astronaut, which is an interactive exhibition helping you to investigate the reality of 
physical and mental challenges that it takes to be a space explorer, to be an astronaut. So that exhibition is on now through Memorial Day. So if you haven't checked it out, we encourage you to head on down to Arizona Science Center and do that. You've only got a couple of weeks left to do that. And you can also catch our new giant screen film, Astronaut Ocean to Orbit, which explores how astronauts train underwater to get prepared for microgravity. So a whole double dip on learning about space exploration there. Uh, and that's it to today. We're really excited to have guests from the Boeing company to talk a little bit more about what they've been doing uh, in terms of space exploration. And before we get to our special guests, I do have a little bit of housekeeping, as I mentioned. I know we've got a lot of folks here who are probably used to virtual events at this point, but just in case it is your first virtual event, check out the chat. You're going to click on that, open it up, and you'll see that you can communicate with each other in there. So go ahead and feel free to add notes in there. Let us know where you're joining from. You can just add comments along the way. But if you have questions with this webinar tonight, we want you to add them to the Q&A box. So that's also at the bottom of your screen. It has a little chat bubble with a Q and an A. Go ahead and click on that. You can type your question right in there and that helps us to curate the questions a little bit easier. Yes, you can see the questions that everybody else has asked and you can upvote them. So that way we know if there's questions, if we run out of time towards the end, we know that those are the questions that everybody really wants to know, the burning questions, if you will. So go ahead and keep an eye on those questions and add all of them there. All right, I hope you guys are ready for this because i have been coming for this event tonight. Uh, it's our main event, right? So we have two amazing engineers from the Boeing company tonight uh, here to talk about the Starliner program. Starliner made history in 2019 by being the first American-made orbital crew capsule to land on land and has ties right here in Arizona. I promise I won't give it all away. I'll let them share more. Uh, because joining us tonight, we have Lewis Atchison, PhD, Chief of Launch and Recovery and Spacecraft Conductor. Gosh, I want to hear more about that. Lewis leads the launch countdown and is the Boeing Mission Control Center at Kennedy Space Center during Starliner launches. He's responsible for developing the launch and landing architecture and directing both the real-time integrated launch countdown and landing site operations for Starliner. Prior to joining the program in 2012, he supported design, tests, and operations on multiple space systems across Boeing. So welcome, Lewis. Hop in there. And that gives us a chance to introduce our second guest, Elizabeth Balga. Mission Integration Operations and Test Engineer on Boeing's CSQ-100 Starliner. So during Starliner test flights and missions, she supports field operations as the hatch and spacecraft operator and the payloads recovery lead. Prior to Starliner, she completed multiple internships and rotations with Boeing on the space launch system, ground-based mid-course defense system, and the 787. So welcome, Elizabeth. Hey, now, thanks for having us. Yeah, I'm really excited for tonight because you both play such a huge part in the future of crude transportation to space and low orbit. So A, I just have to ask before we jump into this, how excited are you? I think we're both really, really, really excited. We're both really excited. <laughs> yeah, we'll both talk about it. <laughs> Excellent. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Give me a chance here to bring up your presentation because I know you've got some great visuals. I'm going to turn myself off so that everybody can hear from you. All right, fantastic. So we'll be, uh, once the presentation comes up here, we'll go ahead and get started. So Elizabeth and I both work on uh, Starliner. Uh, so Starliner in a nutshell is a commercial transportation system uh, that essentially takes us uh, to low earth orbit. It launches from Kennedy Space Center, Florida and provides services, transportation services, a lot like a taxi or an Uber uh, to the International Space Station. The International Space Station is uh, the world's orbiting laboratory. Um, it's been operated continuously for about the past 20 years or so. And uh, since the end of the space shuttle program, uh, the country was really relying on the Soyuz, uh, the Russian Soyuz capsule to take us to the International Space Station. Uh, that's when commercial crew came about and it's a replacement for that transportation service that the shuttle provided. And so we're looking forward to in the not too distant future providing uh, transportation for astronauts uh, into low Earth orbit uh, to do some fantastic science at the International Space Station. Uh, and as I mentioned, it launches from Kennedy Space Center, Florida, and there are a number of landing sites in the Western United States. One of them just so happens to be in Arizona, and we'll talk about more about that uh, a little bit later. So we'll go over to the next chart. All right, a little bit about myself. Um, I have always wanted to work in the space field um, ever since I was a little boy. Uh, I spent the earliest years of my life growing up on the uh, space coast of Florida. 
And uh, so had the opportunity to see several rocket launches. I, I think as a kid, when you start thinking about uh, what you want to be when you grow up, uh, you start thinking about things that go fast, things that um, are exciting, and, and space travel for me was just definitely one of those things. So you can see the little picture uh, in the corner there. I, I, I was bitten by the bug pretty young uh, when it came to space flight, and um, I, I've just been really interested in, in it ever since. Uh, so when it came time for me to go and pick uh, a school, uh, I ended up at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida. I studied uh, uh, spacecraft engineering. I did both my bachelor's and my master's degree uh, at Embry-Riddle. Uh, at that point, I was picked up by the Boeing company to go work as, a internship, as an intern or a co-op in the battery test lab in El Segundo, California. So I spent the earliest parts of my career uh, working on uncrewed satellites in, uh, in Southern California, uh, space vehicles that range from weather satellites to geostationary communication satellites. Uh, and, and that was really where I, I started learning uh, more and more about spacecraft, spacecraft engineering. Along the way, I uh, thought it would be really interesting to do a PhD. Uh, so I did some research in uh, NATO satellites or PICO satellites and uh, did that through the University of Southern California. Um, a little later in my career, an opportunity um, uh, came about where I could go work uh, for a human spaceflight program. And that's really why I got into the business in the first place. Uh, so I joined the commercial crew program in 2012 as a flight test director. Uh, there I learned and worked the test requirements and the test planning for the first uh, two test missions. Uh, from there, I was asked to go work uh, the launch operations architecture. So uh, I started working on the launch procedures. Uh, how do you integrate the Atlas V launch vehicle, the uh, uh, this, the Boeing Starliner spacecraft, the, the flight crew, that integrated day of launch timeline that gets you uh, to that pivotal T0 moment uh, when the spacecraft's ready to, spacecraft and rocket are both ready to launch and fly into space to go uh, meet up with their destination, the International Space Station. Uh, from there, uh, getting into the ground operations, uh, I was also asked to lead the landing and recovery team. And it, that has been an absolutely uh, amazing journey. Uh, working with a team and going from uh, just things for, that are really on the drawing board and, and really doing this uh, from an American space capsule standpoint for the very first time, uh, pulling this full team together and, and working through all the challenges of, of how you get a fully integrated landing operation uh, for a spacecraft landing. And then, oh, by the way, you also have to try to find a way to do it at five different sites. So um, a, a, a absolute joy, pleasure working that, and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you want on that, uh, because I think that's one of the main reasons we're all here today, because uh, just in your backyard, for those of you who are, are dialing in from Arizona, uh, we will likely be having spacecraft landings there in the not too distant future. A uh, little bit about myself, um, I, I, obviously I've always wanted to be an astronaut, always wanted to fly in space. Uh, I love anything involving aviation, uh, so I am a private pilot and also a commercial pilot as well. Uh, I'll, took uh, went through all the flight training all the way through to a uh, certified flight instructor. I can fly multi-engine planes, seaplanes, you name it. Um, I, I've probably tried to fly it at least once or twice. Um, definitely a hobby of mine, but certainly a passion. Uh, I also like scuba diving, anything involving uh, exploration. Um, I, I feel like I'm in the right business and uh, short of getting to go fly in one of these vehicles, I think I have one of the, uh, the more fun jobs and I get to work with some really amazing people like Elizabeth. So uh, fantastic, um, uh, fantastic things we get to do here on, on the Starliner program. So I'll, uh, I think I'll hand it over to Elizabeth and she can talk a little bit about how, uh, how she got to where she is. Sure, didn't you fly a, in a jet recently? <laughs> I did, yes. Lifelong dream. Got to do a little bit of aerobatics in a jet, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So unlike Lewis, I did not always know I wanted to be in the space business, um, nor that I kind of want to be an astronaut one day. Um, so for me, it was a little bit more roundabout of a path. I remember growing up wanting to be every single thing under the sun from, you know, archaeologist to marine biologist. Um, and, you know, everything between, I used to draw my little planes and my, my ships and, and plan them out. Um, but uh, through some, you know, experiences in high school, um, I actually went to a, a boarding school that focused on science and uh, technology and on uh, math and arts and all that kind of stuff. 
And that was really where I started to hone in on what I was interested in doing. Um, and space just seemed to be the perfect way to combine all of those really crazy um, passions that I, I was finding uh, throughout high school and throughout my, my childhood. Um, so on the Starliner program, uh, I am uh, both on the landing and recovery team and a little bit more new, uh, I'm actually on the crew and mission systems team. So um, I work with, uh, with Lewis and the rest of our team to recover the spacecraft after it lands. Um, and one of the cool things I get to do is actually be one of the first few people inside of the vehicle after it lands. Um, and so some of my pictures that you can see down there on the bottom left are actually from our first flight test uh, where we um, landed out in White Sands, New Mexico back in December of 2019, I believe. Um, and we hopped in the vehicle. We did testing on the vehicle right after it landed. And I can't even describe how incredible of an experience it was to watch that spacecraft come back from, from space um, and then also to be able to hop into it just you know minutes after its return. Um, so my background, I went to uh, Georgia Tech. So um, Atlanta, Georgia, went to, uh, I did my bachelor's there. Um, I started interning with Boeing after I think my sophomore year of, uh, in college. And I worked first on the space launch system. And then I came back later and worked on uh, some defense systems. Um, and then I started full time in 2016. And I started in a rotational program that Boeing has. Um, where I was actually out in Southern California and working for the first time on aircraft. So I was working on the 787. Um, through all of that, I just felt the burning desire to be back in space and specifically on human space flight. So uh, Lewis actually helped me to, to work out a role to be working on mission integration and operations and, and on the landing recovery team. Um, so I've been the Starline, I think, for three and a half years now. Um, so since starting, I've worked uh, launch side, I've worked landing recovery side. I've also worked tests during our environmental qualification test campaign, um, but I kind of settled more in the landing and recovery to try to help bring this you know, crazy operation into reality as Lewis described. And so one of the things, uh, like I mentioned, that is kind of new to my role is to work um, on spacesuits and to work on crew testing and crew training. And I'm, I'm just learning about all of that, but it's definitely really exciting. And so that's taking up some of my time as well. Um, and so my fun facts, uh, so I, I'm also a scuba diver. That's actually where I spent my weekend this past weekend down in the Florida Keys. Um, and I am also, uh, it's not on this slide, but I just recently finished my emergency medical technician training. Um, so I, I get to add that to my list of, of skills and knowledge now and, and ways to help um, and I'm also active in some different citizen science campaigns and in different aerospace outreach organizations. And really importantly, um, ways to connect uh, folks like the general public to aerospace and to STEAM. Um, so I'm really excited to be part of that as well. And I think, Luke, it's over to you on the next slide. All right, so uh, a little bit about where we build Starliner. Um, so there was a uh, there were several buildings where they process the orbiter or a space shuttle orbiter uh, as part of that the space shuttle program. Uh, orbiter processing facility number three was transformed uh, just under a decade ago into the commercial crew and cargo processing facility. Uh, that's a pretty big mouthful. So what we do is we just call it C3PF, and that's where Elizabeth and I work on a day-to-day -day basis. And there's a combination of office buildings or kind of a combination of offices. And then we also have a set of high bays and low bays in that building. And that's where the spacecraft is essentially built and constructed from the ground up, which is pretty neat uh, being able to work in a facility where they're building a space vehicle uh, and you get to kind of walk down on the shop floor and get to see it from uh, when it was just uh, basically a piece of structure all the way through to a fully integrated vehicle. Um, Every American human space exploration program uh, at, at, to this point has been involved Boeing or its heritage companies. And, and it's something that we're really proud of uh, being a part of that heritage uh, all the way through from uh, Apollo, Gemini, uh, Mercury, and, um, and, and of course the space shuttle program. So it's, been, it's just been an incredible journey as we've seen Starliner come to life over the past uh, several years here. And um, one of the neat things about Starliner is it is a commercial uh, venture. Uh, so as opposed to 
um, uh, let's say a NASA run program or a government run program. Um, when, it's a, when we talk about commercial spaceflight, we talk about uh, NASA buying a seat on the spacecraft as opposed to buying the vehicle. Uh, so really what that does is it really opens up a lot in the future for uh, private entities and private um, uh, individuals to go purchase seats on Starliner to go uh, perform a science mission or uh, you know whatever, whatever your dreams were, want to take you. Uh, so we can go over to the next chart. And here, you know, I'd like to take a second and talk a little bit about the mission overview. I know uh, some folks on the call may not be familiar uh, with the day in the life of a space vehicle. Uh, so let's kind of start with where it all, it, it, just kind of the basics here, right? We said we want to go to the International Space Station. And I think we've all seen those movies where uh, you see a picture of the Earth and they're in some sort of mission control center and you see the lines going up and down. Um, uh, the planet Earth, and, and really what you're looking at there is a ground track. So in this, uh, what we do on launch day is what we're really doing is lining up the launch of our vehicle uh, to, basically ch to basically catch up to the International Space Station. So we have a very, very specific launch window. It's actually an instantaneous launch window that we have to meet. Um, imagine trying to hop on a moving train. And that's really what we're doing when we start talking about rendezvous or meeting up with something. Uh, we're trying to jump on a train and we're trying to time it exactly right and, and get there at exactly the right time at exactly the right speed so that we could gracefully uh, meet, up at the, meet up at that certain point on orbit. So we launched on the Atlas V rocket and that's out of uh, Launch Complex 41 over at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station and Kennedy Space Center. Uh, we actually built a, a special crew access tower so that we can have the crew uh, go onto that uh, vehicle for, for launch day. The Atlas V vehicle is a, a very successful launch vehicle. It's been launching uncrewed payloads uh, for a very long time. I think they have over 100 successful missions at this point. Uh, so when we went to select the launch vehicle, uh, we wanted to do something with a, an incredible proven track record because, uh, as we all know, humans are very precious cargo, and we want to make sure that we keep them safe. Uh, so that'll be, that's the launch vehicle that we use. Shortly after liftoff, uh, once the vehicle gets into a, uh, a good orbit, we separate from the Atlas V launch vehicle and we begin our journey. The spacecraft has two part portions or components to it. It's a crew module and a service module. So if you look at the, um, uh, the image, the, the third one over here, uh, you'll see kind of like a, a cone-shaped piece and then more of a cylinder-shaped piece. Well, the cone-shaped piece is the, uh, that's the crew module. And that's where the crew uh, that's where the crew operates and, and lives for their short time uh, aboard Starliner. The service module is all the stuff you really need uh, to, um, to maneuver and operate in orbit. It has your extra fuel. It has your orbital maneuvering systems. It's got a solar array on it uh, to help generate power, to keep the spacecraft powered, and it has radiators as well. So um, what we do is that that whole integrated service module, crew module piece, uh, we'll do a series of maneuvers that'll help line it, align it uh, to the correct uh, speed, altitude, orbit, phasing, uh, that'll allow us to dock with the space station. Uh, once we get close to the space station, we, uh, we dock using the NASA docking system, and then we spend uh, up to about six months on orbit, and that's uh, a typical crew rotation on International Space Station. So that's how long the crew would live on, on space station. Now, now, what would typically happen is the same crew that flew up on that Starliner is also going to return on that Starliner. So what we'll do is we'll, um, after uh, the crew's done staying on station, we'll go ahead and pack the vehicle with uh, whatever return cargo they want to return with. Uh, we'll undock, and about four hours later, we'll be on the ground and ready to um, pull, pull the crew out. Uh, so after undocking, we've got a basically do the exact opposite of what the launch vehicle just did and bring us out of orbit. Really cool thing though, um, because we're going down, not up, it doesn't require quite as much energy to get us back down and the atmosphere is gonna do a, a lot of the work for us. Uh, so what we'll do is do a deorbit burn, we'll face in the exact opposite direction that we're going and the service module uh, will fire its thrusters. That'll slow the vehicle down enough so that the, we fall into the atmosphere. And then the atmospheric drag uh, will help do the rest and, and get us slower. Now, just before we, just after we do that burn, what we'll do is separate the service module and the crew module. We don't need the service module to land on land. It's a lot of extra weight and we don't wanna bring it back with us. 
Uh, so the service module will burn up in the atmosphere and the crew module uh, will then go ahead and descend. Now, what happens then as we're descending, uh, the first part of slowing down is really just letting air friction do its thing. We have a heat shield. Uh, what that's going to do is the friction of that atmosphere is going to uh, create heat against uh, the bottom of the vehicle, and that heat shield is going to take the brunt of that force. Uh, what will then happen next is we'll begin a series of parachute deployments that will slowly bring the vehicle down to our touchdown speed. And just before touchdown, we'll jettison that base heat shield uh, that's been protecting the vehicle thermally uh, up until the point where it, um, the, the parachutes come out, and then we'll deploy our airbags. And so between the parachutes and the airbags, that's going to give us a nice, soft, easy touchdown, and it's going to be a very um, uh, comfortable landing for the crew, and it puts us in a nice place to uh, be able to, to go get to the crew. And so Elizabeth's going to talk in a little bit about uh, what the landing and recovery timeline looks like. Uh, but for the most part, we have uh, about an hour to get the crew out and get them into their medical checks. Um, we land about four kilometers away from or the, the vehicle lands about four kilometers away from the ground crew. So it gives us plenty of time to go uh, meet the crew, do safety checks on the vehicle and, and get them out. OK, and hopefully get them home pretty quickly. So go to the next chart. And this is a um, this is a video, and I know there's a little bit of music here, so I'll talk over it a bit. Uh, those lines that you saw were right at liftoff. That's the catenary or the the uh, lightning protection system over at LC41, uh, where we launched out of for OFT1. And what this is is this is onboard video from what we call the Mustang system, and uh, this will show us uh, kind of a, a snippet of each segment of ma the major critical phases of flight that I just talked about all the way through landing. And Miko is main engine cutoff. And so down at the bottom of the screen, you'll see uh, talking about the thruster anomaly uh, or the uh, timing anomaly. Uh, during the orbital flight test one mission, we did have some challenges uh, after we got onto orbit and we had some uh, extra thruster firings that were not planned on. Uh, that caused us to uh, not be in a good place to be able to dock with space station. So that's why we came home uh, earlier than planned. Uh, we're getting ready to fly a second uncrewed orbital flight test mission. And uh, that's going to go ahead and be docking to space station. Our launch date is uh, uh, coming up in the July time, end of July, and uh, we'll be getting ready to go do it again and uh, make it to station this time. So I did see a question come in about Snoopy. Uh, Snoopy is our zero gravity indicator. So Snoopy has been uh, part of the spaceflight heritage uh, since the, uh, I believe it was the Apollo era. And um, it's traditional to fly on, uh, on space vehicles, a, an object that's kind of loosely te tethered. And what that'll allow it to do is whenever you see the vehicle go into a low gravity environment, you'll start to see that object float. And that's what Snoopy was for our program. I think that's the end of the video. So we can go to the next chart. I think that's Elizabeth. All right, so I was just dealing with a little bit of technical issues, but I think I'm back. Let me know if you can't hear me. Um, 
All right. And we can hear you just fine. Okay, great. All right, so I can't see the screen, but I do have a copy of the charts. Um, so when we land in the desert, um, which is uh, actually a, a very first time for an American orbital capsule, um, as Lewis described earlier, um, we have a very time critical, time sensitive timeline that we're following because our priority is to make sure that we've got a safe crew and safe cargo and a safe vehicle. So as Lewis described earlier, we've got five different landing sites. Um, two of them are actually located really close together, but they span the Western US. So the four landing sites, if we continue, or if you consider two of them to be really close together, are in White Sands, New Mexico, Wilcox, Arizona, Dugway Proving Ground in Utah, and Edwards Air Force Base in California. So as I mentioned, right, we've got one just down the street from you guys who are joining in from Arizona. So thank you again to Arizona Science Center for hosting us. Um, and the reason that we have these spread out is, uh, as Lewis described earlier, not only are you battling orbital mechanics to catch up to the International Space Station, but when you undock from the ISS, um, you are battling orbital mechanics in deciding where you're going to return to. So for us, it's really important to have an array of areas that we can uh, land. Um, and in our scenario, we need places that are dry, flat, and um, pretty secure. So a lot of uh, the areas that you'll notice are actually located on military installations. And that allows us to have um, a lot of control over the airspace, a lot of control over um, the surrounding areas. And it also gives us the opportunity to leverage existing infrastructure. Um, so for military installations, there are a lot of people who are trained in being around things like hazardous materials or operating in desert environments. So we're able to pull on those resources from those local areas and augment our team um, with, with experts, really. Um, so one of the coolest things about being part of the landing and recovery team is it really does feel like um, a big camping trip the whole time that you're out there. You know, we're not just working in a factory or working behind a desk or a computer, but you're really getting out into the elements and you're having, like Lewis described earlier, that exploration feel. So we really feel like we're blazing a trail um, both for the American Space Program and also for um, our team. So some of the things that we interface with, you know, you've got rough terrain. Uh, for any of you who are from Arizona or from the or the Southwest, you know, it's not uh, it's not all flat. It's a lot of bumps and it's a lot of sand and a lot of uh, different um, terrain experiences. You've got some interesting wildlife that you're working with, and you've got some uh, the aspect of being in a remote area. So of course, when you're you know landing in a place that um, either be that in the water or in the desert, uh, you have to you know, land somewhere where there's not the chance of, of hitting a person or hitting a house or hitting any sort of public property, right? And that's why we choose these areas that have a lot of open space. Um, so a piece of that is that we have to be able to bring everything that we need for our operation out with us. So instead of being able to just go down the street and go to the emergency room, we actually have to be able to create the infrastructure of having doctors and nurses with us to take a look at the astronauts when they land, as well as being able to quickly provide um, emergency medical care to those astronauts or to anyone on our team um, since we're out in this remote environment. And another thing, of course, landing in the uh, middle of the desert in the middle of December was a pretty cold experience. So we have to prepare our team for environments like that. But you've also got to prepare your teams for landing in the middle of, say, July or August. <laughs> So on the entire opposite end of the spectrum. And so that's not just preparing your teams, but that's preparing your hardware and making sure that you've got all those different environmental aspects taken into consideration when you're planning your operation. So I really like this picture in the bottom left. Um, that's, I believe, from Orbital Flight Test 1 right after we landed. And it was uh, a morning landing. So we actually landed while it was still dark outside. Um, and we saw the sunrise right behind us as we were wrapping up our operation. I am actually not in this picture because I was inside of the spacecraft doing testing. <laughs> so technically I'm in the picture, but not really able to be seen. But um, this just shows you how big and diverse our team is. You know, we've got everyone from engineers and technicians and managers, um, people from NASA and from Boeing, uh, but we've also got 
um, more or less accepted roles. Like we've got firefighters from Boeing who are out here and we've got our military folks, we've got public affairs office. And then one more slide. Let me know when it gets to the next one because I can't see. We are changed. All right, sorry about that. Um, so this slide is also really cool. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, we are putting a lot of emphasis on protecting the, the flight crew and the vehicle as well as the cargo. But um, one of the important things is to also think about protecting our, our ground crew. So um, the folks that I work with are very important to me. You know, we kind of create a family out here on the landing and recovery team. Um, and so we take it very seriously when it comes to uh, working against hazards that the vehicle poses as well as hazards that the environment poses. Um, and we do a lot of training in order to make sure that our team is coming to the table with as much um, knowledge and as much experience as possible. So some of the pictures that you saw, um, Lewis actually corrected me, the previous picture was from um, our mission dress rehearsal. But what you see on the top right here is actually from our orbital flight test. So this is the one where I'm in, I'm not quite in the picture because I'm in the vehicle. Um, and to the left is a training opportunity and the bottom is actually again from orbital flight test one. And so we do uh, consider both the, um, the training opportunities as part of our opportunity to really make sure that we've got a, a sufficient team, um, but we also use it as our opportunity to make sure that we are meeting the post landing milestones that are um, are used in order to make sure that the vehicle and the crew is safe. So the big things that we have to do, um, we have to make sure that we're providing uh, cooling to the vehicle. That makes sure that all of the technical systems and avionics systems on board stay safe, um, as well as all of the propulsion systems on the board stay safe. That also means that the crew inside is safe and comfortable as we work to open the hatch post-landing. Um, and then our second milestone is going to be to actually get out the crew members within 60 minutes of landing. So as you can imagine, that is a pretty sporty operation um, and it requires a lot of training to get that down. Um, and going back to the hazards, you know, on a spacecraft, you don't really think about um, once it lands, you think, okay, it's, it's going to land, it's going to turn off and there's nothing really uh, that you have to worry about anymore. Um, but you still have onboard systems that were used in landing and in uh, achieving a safe landing and a, and a soft landing that are still on board. So we actually train our team to, uh, to detect and to mitigate things like propellant leaks, um, ordnance. We have jettison parts. And what that means is as the vehicle is reentering, as Lewis described earlier, um, we, actually, uh, we actually kick off some pieces of the vehicle and those will land in the area as well. So we work to make sure that our team is aware of those areas and that we have a uh, cleared vehicle landing zone that won't um, allow for any uh, casualties or any any experiences like that to happen. Um, and then also when you are re-entering, you uh, build up a lot of temperature um, and also have the potential to build up static charging. So we have uh, certain procedures in place to make sure that we mitigate those as well. And I think that's all that we had in the main body of the presentation, but I know Lewis and I are both happy to answer questions. That was incredible. Oh my gosh. Um, it's so involved, every single piece of it. And I'm going to jump off because we do have some questions here, um, but I'm going to jump off at asking um, right away, just, you know, with everything that you've done, you talked about a lot of the testing with the engineering design process. A portion of that is basically, you know, you, you fail, you retool, you retest. So what are some of the biggest failures that you've probably learned from as, as part of developing the Starliner program? And either to either of you. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, and and you know, I think we've um, sure. I, I I've got a pretty interesting one here. So we have two command and control vehicles um, that are uh, not shown in any of these pictures, but they really serve as information hubs and places that we've. Uh, uh, that, that we'll go ahead and work from uh, uh, during the landing and recovery operation. Uh, it's where we operate our procedures and test through. It also serves as an optical tracking system. Well, very early on, um, we went through the design cycle of these particular pieces of hardware, and 
they, um, you know, like any new piece of equipment, you're going to have to work out some bugs and some challenges. Well, one of the things that we did not foresee happening uh, with this is when the vehicles were delivered, uh, we ended up with some challenges with them being a little bit heavier than they needed to be to, to be on the road. So what we found is we had these vehicles that were absolutely fantastic for off-road uh, expeditionary type um, command and control operations. Uh, but from a wake standpoint, uh, it was a little challenging to find ways to get them on the road. Uh, so what we ended up having to do is uh, really, it, it was an easy solution, uh, just took some time to get it right. Uh, was to offload weight from the vehicle so that we could get the axle weights right so that we could drive on the roads legally. And, um, and, and I know that was, uh, that was one of those things that we just didn't expect to, um, to have happen. Um, it, it's one of those, uh, you, know, you know, the more you more check your plumbing, uh, the easier it is to get the drain stopped up. It's, uh, it, it was just one of those things that we had to, to go work through. And I think one of the neat things with landing recovery is there's always op opportunities um, to really improve the operation. Uh, especially as we use this equipment more and more in the, the desert terrain, um, we find out that uh, that things maybe don't behave or handle as well, or maybe they're harder to maintain than we'd like them to. So we're always iterating and finding better ways to do things and, and kind of more clever ways. And it's really fun to be an engineer uh, working on a program like this because you have the opportunity to go make changes real time in the field with some of this ground support equipment and, um, and from from run to run that we'll do in some of these exercises uh, to really hone in how we use the equipment. Thank you. And there's a specific questions about uh, the perfect launch. How many tests did it take to find the perfect launch? Uh, I'm sorry. What, what was the question again? It, uh, they're asking a, a similar question about uh, trial and error here. How many tests did it take to find the perfect launch that actually until it actually worked? Yeah. So um, yeah, I, I guess if I understand the correct the, the the question correctly, um, in in order to get to launch, we run a number of tests. Um, fortunately, uh, because of the, the the way the launch vehicle heritage was. Uh, the way we, you know, we kind of established that the launch vehicle had a great deal of heritage. And when I say heritage, it's flown a lot very successfully. We didn't have to do a lot of testing on the launch vehicle, uh, but there, there was several tests that we had to do for this new fully integrated system. We're the first vehicle to fly on an Atlas V rocket without a, um, uh, without a fairing. And a fairing is that thing that encapsulates or covers up the payload. Most satellites aren't designed to be flown in the air. They're designed to be in space where there's no air. So, uh, so we, they encapsulate it in this kind of a nose cone, basically. And our vehicle, uh, our vehicle, uh, we fly without that uh, to allow a more rapid crew escape because our launch vehicle, or the way our vehicle is designed, it's designed to have an escape system in case we do have an issue uh, on launch. So there were several tests involving wind tunnels uh, in order to get that design right. Um, the design matured over several years before we finally reached that final look where you see the uh, service module or the crew module, the service module, and then there's like an arrow skirt in order to get the proper wind profile. So those are kind of some of the tests that we do uh, in order to, to get to the point where we can um, really claim success and have a, a good fully integrated system that's ready to go fly. Thank you. I'm hoping that answers our guest question. Um, we have a couple questions here about uh, descent and landing. So uh, when we were talking in the PowerPoint, uh, there was a question, did you mention that the heat shield is jettisoned during descent? And can you share how that's done? It's very specific. Yeah, uh, we have an ordnance-based separation system. So uh, there's uh, timing, it's a timing-based system. And what it'll do is when the vehicle uh, gets to the right point in the descent profile, it'll pop those off and um, and then uh, it, it essentially fires the separation mechanisms that'll drop the, just let the gravity do the work. So, so the heat shield, so if you think about it, the parachutes, and, and I, uh, I'm a little Starliner model here, right? The parachutes are pulling the vehicle or slowing the vehicle down at the same time that the, uh, the base heat shield's being separated. So while the vehicle is slowing down, the base heat shield's not being slowed down anymore. And so it just falls to the ground.
Thank you. All right. So the other question about descent and landing is, are the airbags capable of letting the capsule float on water? You guys talked about the landing sites being mostly in the desert, but if it had to land in water, could it float? Yeah, in fact, that's one of our uh, that's one of our emergency operation modes. Uh, so, in the uh, unlikely event that we have either a pad abort and a scent abort, where we have to go off of the launch vehicle in the event of an emergency, uh, the vehicle will parachute down and land on the water. Uh, it's also a capability of the vehicle that it could land in the water in an emergency. And uh, that could be coming back from orbit early, uh, leaving space station early when a land landing site is not underneath the spacecraft. Uh, so there's different configurations uh, of how the airbags will inflate. And um, one of the configurations is a water landing uh, based uh, airbag deployment. And that'll allow the vehicle to float uh, while rescuers go uh, to get the vehicle. Now, the reason the vehicle is designed to land on land is uh, really a, use, a reusability uh, is a reusability concern. Salt water and electronics don't really mix too well, uh, so we try to avoid dipping the spacecraft into salt water. And um, and so we prefer to land on land, uh, but we do have the capability to land on water if needed. Thank you. Okay, so another one of our viewers wants to know, uh, did either of you have anything to do with the SpaceX launch? D different company. <laughs> Figured I'd ask it just to be thorough here. Um, no, so that's perfectly fine. <laughs> switching gears to some uh, more broader thinking about space exploration. Um, you know, the Starliner program is all about crewed missions to space. So why is it, and this is, uh, you know, I'd love to hear from both of you, why do you think it's important for humans to travel to space? Great question. Yeah, I'll let Elizabeth take that one first. Oh, we're muted, Elizabeth. I think you're double muted. All right, double. Ah, so we're still having some trouble with the, the technology in there. Yeah, so I'll go ahead and go first while she's uh, working at her audio issue. Um, you know, there's, there's a couple different reasons. I, I think one of the most important reasons is um, space exploration offers us an opportunity to just learn so many incredible things. And, and it's not just the destination of going there to go learn things, it's the journey that also teaches us a lot. Uh, there have been so many vast technological improvements that we've needed to, to solve as a, you know, as a human people in order to get to space in the first place, um, that, that's just been amazingly rewarding uh, for, for society and for, um, for technological advancement. And then I, I think the other piece of it is, it gives us an opportunity to really learn about how is our solar system formed? How was our planet? Uh, how was our planet formed? Uh, you have an opportunity to do research and science that you just can't do on the earth. So I think it's, it's really incredibly important. And I think lastly, space flight's just one of those things that brings people together. I mean, the international space station is this incredible example of an orbiting laboratory with um, so many nations that come together to make uh, to make such tremendous scientific achievements, and, and I think it's just one of those things that it, it, it just gives us all something to aspire to and, and look up to, uh, both literally and figuratively. I think I do have audio now, but I don't know how to follow that. <laughs> You're back. Um, yeah. So I think for me, um, like I mentioned earlier, you know, the thing that really pushed me going into space was the fact that not only does it unite people, but it unites so many dis different disciplines and it unites so many different ideas. Um, it's really something where everyone has a voice and everyone can contribute. Um, even someone like me from a small town in Louisiana uh, can be someone, you know, who has a big impact on the space program. Um, but can also look forward to the future of humanity, right? We're not just doing this um, for us, we're doing it for the future and for what's next. And we're building a better world, um, both on and off the planet. Those are awesome answers. Thank you both for those. Um, so a couple more questions here. We're keeping an eye on our time, but we've got some time for these questions. Uh, Catherine says her son has a degree in political science. He wonders if there are politics in aerospace 
uh, and a, specifically about maybe who owns the vehicles, areas, and anything else you might want to share about. Um, I'm sure this might be loaded, but at the same time, really interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's politics on so many levels, right? When you think about, for example, a, a, the space program in the US, we uh, really think about trying to spread out the work, right? One of the big things is about trying to get um, uh, support from across the US and make sure that we're putting opportunities um, in Arizona and putting opportunities in Louisiana, like Michoud Assembly Facility um, and opportunities in Florida, like Kennedy Space Center. Um, but we're also looking at uh, higher levels of politics. So you're thinking of once we start thinking about going back to the moon or going to Mars, who owns the moon? Who owns Mars? Who's allowed to make decisions on how we utilize those resources? Um, so it's a really, really big area that's becoming even bigger. And there's a lot of international politics, really, that you can start to get into. Um, there's also a lot of things that you can look into about just trying to figure out how do you start a society on the moon or Mars, right? How do you, if you had to not just extend your society that we have here, um, you know, the International Space Station is an international effort, but we are pretty close to Earth, right? You're going to still be governed by the same rules that you have on Earth. Um, but once you start thinking further and further, uh, and it gets into the science fiction-y realm, you really have to think about how do you build a society and how do you take the laws and regulations and ways of life that we have on Earth and uh, impact culture and political science in, in the future. Thank you. All right, so our last question has to do with uh, sustainability. And actually, I think it ties right into what you're talking about is even thinking about establishing permanent um, colonies in other places off the planet. Um, so sustainability, the question here specifically is, do you reuse the vehicle? But I think there's a bigger question here about the overall sustainability um, from the, the program as a whole. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think, Louis, you touched on it before. Um, the reason that we want to land on land is because we want to be able to reuse the, the Starliner spacecraft. Um, in particular, we do reuse the uh, the top part, so the capsule, the crew capsule. Um, so as Lewis described earlier, we've got a crew module and a service module. We've also got the launch vehicle. So currently the uh, ULA launch vehicle, Atlas V is not a reusable launch vehicle. Um, the service module is not reusable, but our crew module is. So the same crew module that launched and landed for OFT-1 is going to be reused in a future mission. Thank you. So important. And I think, you know, we, we don't always think about the fact that, you know, we, we need to be able to reuse things and think about how they're going to be used, you know, both in space and then reusing them back on Earth as well. So um, I love yeah. thought about so many different things. And it's just such a cool and exciting program. And we're just about out of time for today. So I'm going to ask our absolute final question. I know we've got a lot of folks um, who, on today who are just inspired. You both talked about your journeys to becoming, uh, you know, STEM professionals working in the space program. So uh, would you each share maybe some tips uh, that you have for anybody thinking about either going into a STEM career or thinking about changing STEM careers? Yeah, so I, I think the, the most important thing is you need to follow what you're passionate about. Um, I, I think you have to be passionate about what you wanna do. So if you, you wanna go into a career in STEM, um, it, it definitely should be something that you love and wanna do. I, I think it's, um, it's certainly a lot of hard work and dedication uh, being on that journey, uh, but I think the best way to chart your course is to uh, to just look at other examples out there. I know when I was uh, looking at my career early on, I, I, I spent a great deal of time uh, just looking at what jobs were out there and what were some of the requirements that they needed to see fulfilled in order to have some of those kind of really awesome jobs that weren't necessarily the jobs that I would get right out of college, but maybe uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years down the road and, and kind of go back and trace my steps of what are those, what are the things that they're looking for? And then what should I go do to, to really achieve that, that particular position or, or, or that particular job? Yeah. And so um, from my perspective, right, the biggest thing is just, again, passion, but also just believing in yourself. Honestly, there were times going through college where I thought I am not smart enough for this major. I'm not, you know, there's maybe a class that isn't quite clicking. And I don't use half of what I learned, but I do use the other half. And I definitely use the fact that I can 
learn how to learn, right? So as you're going through middle school, high school, and college, really just focus on how do you learn? How do you best pick up information um, and really use that to your advantage? And then the other piece of just um, finding what you're passionate about, you know, I, if you asked me in high school what I was going to be when I grew up, I definitely would not have said I'm going to go recover astronauts from the desert. Um, so just trust in the process of, of figuring out what you are, uh, what you enjoy, what you're good at, um, and just trusting that as long as you're bringing your best self to work or to school and to all your relationships, um, you're going to end up in a position where you're going to look back and say, wow, I accomplished something really incredible and I never would have guessed that this is where I would be. Um, so even if you don't have the the perfect 10 year plan figured out or the 20 year plan. I think Lewis, you probably had a 50 year plan fig figured out. Um, but just trust that, you know, as long as you're working hard and as long as you're putting your all into it, taking on opportunities, be it little projects uh, at home um, or, you know, helping helping to fix the, the, the plumbing under the sink or even big product projects like being part of, you know, first robotics or, you know, working on some sort of uh, or going to Arizona Science Center and checking out one of their exhibitions, right? Those different opportunities to learn and to experience and gain skills are really what's going to make the difference in the long run um, as you join a, a career in STEM. Those are fantastic answers. We're all about the passion, all about exploring opportunities. So thank you both for that. And thank you each for your contributions to space exploration. It's just so exciting. I've like I said, I've been waiting for a long time for this conversation. So it was great to hear about what's happening. Uh, and thank you also to the Boeing Company for your constant support of STEM education, truly uh, exceptional. So that's it for tonight. Okay, thank you again for being here, Lewis and Elizabeth. We appreciate you so much. And thank you to all of you at home who are able to join us tonight. Our next astronaut virtual series will take place two weeks from now. We'll have a, a live virtual chat with Jim Bell, research scientist at Arizona State University, who's been part of several different Mars programs. So we'll hear from him in a couple of weeks. Um, also, uh, we're gonna hear a bit about what he envisions for the future of space tourism. So you'll all have to join us then. Regi uh, registration and more information about that talk is available online at azscience.org, along with information about pretty much everything else we talked about today, including the astronaut exhibition, the movie, and everything else that we have going on to help you get connected with science at Arizona Science Center. So that's it for tonight. Stay safe, stay curious, and we'll see you all next time. Lewis and Elizabeth, thank you one more time for being here. This was fantastic. Thank you. Appreciate you having us. And don't forget, we launch on July 30th. Ooh, we'll talk about that. That sounds like an opportunity. <laughs> Bye, everybody.